at eye level. Dear community, welcome to another issue at eye level with you, with an audience. I am delighted, we are in Hamburg, welcome. Wonderful atmosphere here, so many lovely people, I'm really looking forward to this program. It's about a topic that will certainly get us really fired up this evening. It's already quite warm here, and I'm afraid it might get a bit hotter. It's about energy and inflation, how do we deal with the crisis? That's what we want to talk to my guests about today. I warmly welcome Professor Ulrike Gerrit. You are a political scientist and publicist. Yes. And there are a few questions that I wrote down about current politics. I am pleased that you are here for the first time here at Fair Talk. I am happy to be here. Welcome. My second guest Judith Flora Schneider, entrepreneur. Welcome to Hamburg, Ms. Schneider. Thank you for the invitation. You have written one or two letters to the federal government and have emphasized your displeasure, and I would like to talk to you about this today. Thank you for coming. I am very happy about the invitation. Then I welcome Dr. Hans-Jürgen Vols. Hello Mr. Vols. I wrote it down, Head of Economics of the Federal Association of Medium-Sized Businesses, it's a whole sentence. In one word, Chief Economist. <laughs> Very nice, Chief Economist, welcome. And also a warm welcome for the first time here at Fair Talk, Mark Friedrich, financial expert and author. Did you have a good journey, Mr. Friedrich? Yes, except for one cab driver. Yes, that was somehow, my hometown of Hamburg doesn't have a good one. Did not leave too positive impression. But I went in with a lot of love then, which was okay. I would like to talk to them this evening about how we can make people the focus of politics again. And to introduce the group a bit first, so that we can get talking to each other, Ms. Garrett, political scientist, what does a political scientist actually do all day? Now political science analyzes systems, political systems, party dynamics, institutional systems, power relations, media systems, and so on. Today this is diverse, it is also a new science. Historical science has been known for centuries, political science actually only since 49, denazification of the Federal Republic, keywords federal agency for civic education, so that one, so to speak, scientifically studies state studies. What am I doing all day? I teach, of course not during the semester break, but soon again, so I have a few semester hours. Then there are faculty and committee meetings, I correct dissertations and master's theses, I supervise students. And what else? do I do? For example, I sit on talk shows and I write books, my next one comes out on the 24th of October. Ms. Schneider, you have a business, a company, a company called Carpetland Zeus. Did I say it right? Carpetland. Tepichbadenland Zeus. But that's not my point. It's actually about drawing attention to the fact that things can't go on like this. That which is actually clear to all of us. And not just as an employer, I also explicitly stand up for my employees because I think it's no longer acceptable for them. A quote from your current letter to the government in Berlin. Politicians have managed to make it almost impossible for small and medium-sized businesses to survive their disastrous decisions. Now that is such a very short excerpt, we will also go into the letter later. But have you received any kind of response to it? I see the question was redundant. 
Is my silence enough? No, I really got a lot of great and positive letters. Our email inboxes in both branches, with different email addresses, were overflowing with people who thanked us for these open words. I found that extremely amazing. I've also gotten really sad numbers from people who have fallen into depression and don't know what to do anymore. By people who are basically on the fringes of their economy because they have financing and do not know how it should or can be paid for. It was tragic, funny, uplifting, everything was there, but no answer from our politicians. No, so I don't think the letter even ended up in the outer office. It probably went straight into the trash or something. Mr. Voles, is that a typical example of what you experience in your daily work? Companies that are desperate and angry, that don't know how to cope anymore? Yes, that is indeed the case. The number of these companies is growing. Our association conducted a survey four weeks ago. Four out of ten companies saw themselves in a situation that threatened their existence. Today we got the result of the same survey back again, it is now just over 50%. So the number of companies that really have their backs to the wall in the current situation, that have hardly any options left to pay their liabilities, whose liquidity continues to decline, that have no equity left, is extremely high. And the situation is getting worse by the day. What are these calls and letters? So if I'm in Ms. Schneider's position now and I'm really angry, do you currently also have to take on some kind of psychological activity? Yes, we try to use the opportunities that we have. It's not that nothing has been decided at all, but the possibilities are relatively modest. It was often the case during the corona pandemic that there was a lot of resentment that the entire bureaucratic process involved in getting corona aid really brought many companies to the brink of a nervous breakdown. Because, for example, the procedure was changed during the application process, the applicants, the examiners, such as tax consultants, auditors, were not informed about this, and the applications were left for weeks or months without any feedback and those affected did not know how to pay their liabilities and the wages of their employees. And these annoyances are also becoming apparent in the current situation. The imbalances in relation to the so-called relief packages, which are essentially about redistribution and less about actually presenting effective, noticeable relief for the affected medium-sized companies. Mr. Friedrich, forgive me for asking, are you already taking a cold shower? <laughs> I'm from Swabia, we still use the washcloth. I'm sorry if it smells a bit, I'm sorry. I am a loyal citizen. Yes, I actually generally take cold showers, would recommend it to anyone, you save energy and money and it wakes you up and is good for circulation. But that's another topic. The former editor-in-chief of the news magazine Der Spiegel and editor-in-chief of Die Welt, when asked whether Robert Habeck was overwhelmed, stated succinctly, of course, that was obvious. He just said that in a Die Welt interview. But after all, there must have been people who voted for him. Ms. Garrett? Maybe they were overwhelmed too? Or didn't take a cold shower? Now we're talking. <laughs> What can I say? Of course we had elections, of course this coalition was elected. Of course, it is also a new coalition, not to say problematic. We haven't seen that before, two formerly left-wing parties, the SPD and the Greens, going into a coalition with the FDP. It's very unusual. As a political scientist, I see the unusual thing in that we actually see the dissolution of the classic party system. It's all about government majorities as they come about. It's no longer about the political orientations of governments that used to exist. They were either social liberal or Christian liberal, so to speak. 
It's all gone. This means that not only here in Germany, but also in Italy and France, for example, people are trying to find out what can be put together politically, and that of course leads to problematic politics. Attempts are being made to develop coalition concepts that go beyond one's own ideological or party political horizon. This is what we are experiencing now. When asked about Habeck, what should I say? I mean, I have a feeling, and I would share that around the table, that an entire government is going into a tailspin. Of course we all see that, there is already talk of new elections. But it's a matter of chaos management. So I'm not quite ready to blame individuals for the overall condition. I don't want to legitimize it at all, but rather think about how we as a society got into such a hustle and bustle. How could it even happen that we got into such a rut, so to speak, where we now have the feeling that things are going down so steeply and then say it's because of Mr. Lauterbach or Habeck or Annalena? It's the result of the failed policies of the past decades, one almost has to say. And actually we are a mixture of hubris, complacency and complete excessive demands. And this late Roman decadence that we experience, that we have secondary theaters of war on which we then work for hours, weeks, months in parliament and don't solve the actual problems. These are now falling on our feet, a failed energy policy is just a shambles, inflation has gotten completely out of hand. And we talk about gendering and the self-determination law. And that's the sign of the end of a cycle, and that's why we have these problems. We're just doing too well. And now, unfortunately, it's getting worse before it gets better. But it's getting better, I promise. Can I say something about that? I agree that the smallness of politics today probably shocks everyone. That we're actually talking about showerheads or 19 degrees on the radiator instead of saying, we're in an avalanche. That was my image earlier, a political system is running down the mountain. Then the question is, what are the politicians doing? And now they're saying, we've got an avalanche, make sure that you somehow stretch a net in front of your house so that the avalanche doesn't catch you like that. The smart political question would be how can we stop the avalanche? Or why did it go off in the first place? And nobody thinks about that. What I miss most is that we look at politics from above, so to speak, and say which decisions were made and which ones were wrong. Today we are talking about inflation. But why? Because we supplied heavy weapons worth a hundred billion? The question is, did it have to be? Did it have to be immediate and almost pass parliament? Did we have to spend millions and billions on corona? So where does the avalanche start? This results in these small details, where everyone then asks themselves, do you seriously want to give us shower instructions on television? It is well described that left and right have now swapped places in politics. The Greens are suddenly a war party. The CDU has moved more and more to the left in recent years in order to win over left-wing voters. It suddenly propagated the energy turnaround and the nuclear phase-out, and everyone was suddenly happy. The CDU actually made life hell for the SPD. We see that everything is kind of upside down, and that's problematic. We no longer know which party stands for what. We can see that politicians are completely overwhelmed by the current situation because they have really been stumbling from one crisis to the next for years. We are in permanent crisis mode, how should companies recover? We've had corona lockdowns, now comes the energy crisis, the raw materials crisis, broken supply chains, the next crisis, many companies just won't survive this. Tense times are coming. Before I come to Mr. Voles, I would like to hear from you where you see the reasons for how it came to this. I learned, so I didn't study business administration, but it was clear to me, and my father said it, a democracy needs a healthy middle class. And it is now threatening to go down the drain. I would like to know from Ms. Schneider, Ms. Schneider, what is your day-to-day -day business like at the moment? And what has the corona crisis caused you? And are you also close to closing? Have they closed the doors yet, right? Only from the 1st of September. We are no longer allowed to leave the door open from September. We actually had a customer on September 1st who came in smiling and said, why is your door open? It has to be closed from today. We are not close to closing now. I think we can still do it. I spoke briefly to Mr. Voles about it earlier, we had the great advantage that we were in such a good financial position that we didn't have to use any corona aid, for example, even though our shop was closed for months. That I did not send my employees on short-time work, but simply continued to pay them. 
even if they were only there by the hour or not at all, because I said from the outset that I wouldn't do it. I don't do that with state aid, and I find the incentive completely wrong, from all association officials, whether chambers of industry and commerce, or hotel and restaurant associations, it doesn't matter. There was only a cry for state aid instead of ensuring that we are allowed to exercise our professional rights, our free choice of profession. I am still of the opinion that all the precautions could have been taken. And to this day nobody can explain to me why the supermarkets were full and weren't closed because a corona case had allegedly occurred somewhere, but we had to close with large houses, despite the required square meters. And especially in our area, which I can judge, the customers would have had no problem not meeting each other and could easily have kept a distance of several meters. Or we could have let people in one at a time etc. But that's an old topic now. Although I don't think it's that old. Because we all know a person who we may perhaps describe as somewhat difficult to understand mentally, I don't know how else to articulate myself. And of course we don't know what's still to come. Two years ago there was what I call the conspiracy theory, that it was just the blueprint for the next lockdown. Energy lockdown, or whatever else is coming, eco lockdown, I don't know. So I think it's not over yet. I don't know if I'm allowed to say it so openly now, I'll just say it, we really had crying customers on the phone who said, I have to move, should I live on concrete now? And I said no, officially we're allowed to serve you at the door, and we're also allowed to hand you something at the door. Of course we let him in. I think that's great because it describes the problem exactly. We're talking about crises, and the real question is, are these real crises or homemade crises? And the fact is that for the most part these are simply homegrown crises, because what you just described simply shows that it was completely ideological politics that could no longer be explained with reason. Not to me. So neither do I, neither do I. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm going to answer a question you didn't ask me. I think that's good if you take on the role of moderator. From my own experience I can say that I would not want to accuse any member of the federal government, at least not those I have met personally, not even the Minister for Economic Affairs, that they are not of goodwill. But I'll be tempted to say that it's useful to acquire knowledge in your area of responsibility. <laughs> As far as I know, anyone who wants to run a craft business in Germany needs a master craftsman's certificate. And if such requirements are made at this lower level, so to speak, then one should actually expect that it should be similar at the level that decides the wheel and woe of the entire country and the entire economy. If they don't have the knowledge, then they should at least seek advice, from both sides. Both by those who may be ideologically biased and by those who favor mandated supply-side economic policies. Ultimately, economic laws cannot be overridden, not even by an ideology, no matter how well-founded it is. During the election campaign, for example, you can demand and introduce a minimum wage of 12 euros, but it has to be paid by employers. And if these 12 euros are not covered by a productivity increase, then it goes to the substance. Then labor is substituted by capital, or the farmer in Lower Saxony, Schleswig-Holstein no longer grows blueberries or asparagus or cabbages in Didmarschen, but they are imported from Spain, at certainly higher ecological costs. And you don't have an energy transition that you set as a goal from the outset if you don't know how to get there to ensure security of supply and affordability, two essential factors for the entire economy. Regardless of whether it is a medium-sized company or a group, 
A big, common mistake in politics is that there is no differentiation between medium-sized companies and corporations. Corporations are globally active around the world. So if the energy costs in Germany shoot up now, then production will be relocated to where it is cheaper, currently to the USA, Canada, and small and medium-sized companies do not have these options. They are tied to the framework conditions in Germany. In terms of bureaucracy, labor costs and, of course, energy costs. May I briefly? <laughs> the retail trade, which is stationary anyway, is hit even harder. And not every retail store is able, or perhaps doesn't want to, go online. I just don't want that, for example, because I don't want to submit to this price war on the internet. So, in principle, only the stationary trade remains for me. In addition, I don't want to expect any customer to dump the roll of carpet on his sidewalk, as the haulage company does, and the octogenarian man doesn't know how to drag it upstairs to the third floor. That is out of the question for us. But how can I now, if I am stationary in retail, for example, what can I do so that I can survive here in any way? What can I do? We have had extremely good experiences with these companies that have digitized both procurement and sales. Seen in this way, the corona pandemic acted as an accelerator, as a catalyst. We have many examples of successful implementation. So then online trading? I haven't experienced a total denial, not from a single company. As for my advice, I hope that you have a large customer base who are reluctant to give up your services and your products. Our former president Mario Hofer coined the phrase, if you don't move with the times, you move with the times. From there I would really strongly recommend, take every opportunity to offer your products online as well. It doesn't always have to be a price war, a downward price trend. You have a special reliability in terms of deliveries, in terms of product variety, others may not be able to keep up. We rely on the Berlin location because we also deliver. I also have a service department. We deliver, lay carpet or tear it out, turn old into new, etc. That makes no sense at all for us, definitely not. I'm not in favor of abolishing cash either. I don't want that. There are also others. We have followed a clear line from the outset, according to Dostoevsky, cash is freedom, live freedom. And that's why no one can do without cash. No one who thinks the situation through, and also because of experiences made in situations where the power went out. So we do not support this development, and the Deutsche Bundesbank has also gone along with it, at least so far. An important issue is deindustrialization, which we are seeing in part. Companies are starting to introduce short-time working, shutting down production to save energy costs, and many are seriously considering relocating production, I hear this from the customer base. And as you said, USA is just the big winner for example, because energy costs are cheap through fracking gas, through fracking oil, but also through tax incentives. But other companies will have to close gates. Bakeries, metal, glass, chemicals, that is, energy-intensive industries, will not survive. The production of aluminum is no longer worthwhile. Production in Germany costs 9,000 euros per ton. The problem is, it costs 2,400 euros on the world market. So what really smart entrepreneur keeps producing if he makes a loss with every ton of aluminum? And we see that in all industries. I spoke to a baker who has several branches in Lower Saxony, who says I'll just close my 16 branches because I'll be down 60,000 euros from January 1st. But I can't expect the citizens to pay 2 euros for a roll or 9 euros for a loaf of bread. Because then people just go to Aldi, to Netto, and buy the industrial park goods there for 59 cents, because it's still cheaper. So we really have to be careful here, because if companies close here, then the unemployment rates will also go up. And the social system can now do that with the new refugees, with the billions for the relief package, inflation compensation law, corona, etc. The state cannot finance that. We are the state, we foot the bill. That means either the state has to take on new debts for which we are all liable, or it has to start raising taxes, there is no other option. The ECB could also step into the breach. So this is really an accumulation of problems like never before in our lives.
And in my opinion, politicians are acting completely headless and overwhelmed and are trying to somehow extinguish the fires, some of which they started themselves. Right. It's true what Mr. Voles said, what I'm experiencing with this clarity for the first time, is actually the split between DAX corporations and medium-sized companies. That is actually new in this republic. We were always proud of being an export nation in Germany, and so on everyone knows the stories. But we've also known for a long time that SMEs are the backbone of DAX corporations, so to speak, and this balancing act that is now being done, the DAX companies all go home safely, they have no problem. Problem. They can relocate to Canada, to the USA, they simply produce worldwide. Location-based or small businesses cannot do that. Something is broken, I would say, which we have had in the Federal Republic for a long time. Namely, business representatives who, of course, have cooperated with politics, always in the sense of reason, which is good for this state. It's kind of split now, like a blow with an axe. And that, of course, has social and societal consequences. Who is in the DAX companies? Who works there? In which schools are their children? In which cities do they live? And where are the people from the middle class? In which cities are they and so on? That means that the economic divide is followed by a social and societal divide, I think everyone can experience that. And I see it in universities. I have the feeling that public universities are really just a kind of instantaneous water heater, so that the rich kids can get into the London School of Economics. Completely different careers are made there, you can see that very clearly. So who stays down to earth, so to speak, and who goes international? And so this economic divide, in my opinion, leads to a social and societal divide. And then I ask myself, will democracy survive? How much division will a democracy survive if we just don't get cohesive anymore? And don't understand anymore that everyone is important to society in their place and that we all need that. We need small and medium-sized businesses, we need industry, we might even need a political scientist. And we need functioning universities, and especially functioning media. I would like to substantiate the importance of small and medium-sized enterprises on the basis of figures. 99,6% of all companies, about 3.5 million, are small and medium-sized enterprises, up to 249 employees. 80% of all training places and 60% of all employees are in SMEs and almost 50% of the added value is generated in SMEs. That is why our Minister Altmaier first developed an industrial strategy in his ministry during the last legislative period before turning to medium-sized companies. That can show a little what the values are. And indeed we experience that from Monday to Friday the praises of the middle class are sung, but as far as the decision is concerned, things look different again. It is too often the case that we hope to be heard, it is also often the case that legislative proposals are sent to us from the ministries with two or three days to comment on them. We feel a little disadvantaged there, especially since small medium-sized companies do not have their own departments to deal with paperwork, to put it succinctly. Corporations can do it, they have entire departments that only deal with legal requirements, with new rules and laws. SMEs can't do it, they are mainly busy getting orders and processing them. May I say something else? I actually believe that the political transmission belt no longer works, so to speak. In Dessau the other day, 10,000 people demonstrated, which is a lot for the small town of Dessau. That was a baker's guild or something. In relaxed times in the Federal Republic, the CDU would have been there as a people's party, but it wasn't there. But the problem is, of course, and we're back to the media and what's being reported, which protests are politically heard. Which which protest has a political relay, so to speak, does it go into politics and change something there? 
Whichever protest is now framed as right-wing is now, so to speak, the classic every protest, including social protest, is a priori right-wing. And I really don't understand that. I don't understand at all what's going on in the parties. Let's take the CDU as an example, which always started as a classic people's party and was always proud of the fact that it was the middle-class party. Likewise, it was proud to be the European party and so on. To put it straight away, the bourgeois fat belly of this republic. And I don't know exactly what's broken, the political transmission belt of this middle class social protest, as you say. Why this protest is not heard. Perhaps I can still understand this with the Greens, because sociologically, the middle class is of course not the Green voters. But for me, there are really a lot of question marks, and I've actually been wondering since Corona, probably similar to you. Now also with this Ukraine conflict and the money that is spent there. I'm doing something mundane now, but at the time of the export world champion, banking crisis, euro crisis, the chancellery stood tight. And now, for two or three years, we've had a situation where we can't even get a decent letter together. The heads of the three largest business associations say, we are the presidents of these three major business associations and we say we do not want that. We want the money to be managed differently. As you said, Herr Friedrich, we are sovereign, which means we pay for everything. Quite apart from the fact that we have a liberal finance minister, with FDP tax cuts and so on, we will now build up the largest mountain of national debt that the Republic has ever seen. It's a special fund. Sure, but... Yes, that sounds better, sounds better. I just wanted to get to the point. Where did the transmission belt break that the massive protest from the middle class no longer reached the parties? I have questions, but no answers. I am very interested. Because just, that's all right-wing extremist or something like that. That can't work. Yes, that is the argument and actually the decomposition strategy of the Ministry for State Security. One is discredited and stigmatized. That's already easy if you don't face the arguments. So you can immediately end the argumentation of the opponent by simply saying, you are now against corona, or against vaccination. Against arms deliveries. That is why you are a Nazi. And that is the end of any argumentation immediately. So you don't have to face the arguments at all. That's easy, that's convenient. May I have a moment? Very short. I think it's really cool that you're all clapping. But you should rather make your voice heard, or intervene, when people are being discredited simply because they have an opinion of their own, which is then well-founded. Because who is silent, agrees. It's a very good book. And we were all silent. We all know someone who could narratively disagree like that, and as soon as you disagreed, you were immediately labeled and defamed. Our culture of debate suffers as a result. That's why it's so important that we all sit down, talk respectfully to each other even if we don't agree, but look into each other's eyes afterwards and say thank you for the conversation. Because a democracy lives on discourse, and it must also be able to come to terms with other opinions, and unfortunately we have lost that in recent years. Because Lauterbach came, or someone else, all called Nazis, no debate, no argument, even if the other side tried to argue with data and facts. That's where we have to go again, otherwise our democracy is really in danger. But I have to admit. So I have to. I have to confess that one day in the fall of 2020 I just stopped engaging in the discussion because I didn't feel like being loudly insulted anymore. So I can definitely understand that, I can absolutely understand that. So I would. It's a touchy subject, but in my own experience, I've been getting insulted at all levels for about three years now, and it's really unnerving. You just wonder when it will actually stop and if you want to run into the nearest wall, so to speak. At this point, I would like to say that even though you get a lot of letters that help a lot and make you feel that what we are doing is important, but in the end, there are really states of exhaustion. 
How long can you actually stand it when it systematically comes from all sides? We talked about this earlier in the mask, I don't want to go into it now, but how often have I experienced it in the last few weeks that I'm invited somewhere, I'm already in the program, and then three days later I'm uninvited again? Like Norddeutscher Rundfunk. That's part of it, but he wasn't the only one. And if you systematically experience what it does to you, what do I feel about it? I'm still the same, but above all you are invited first and then uninvited. You can no longer explain it. Nobody gives an account of it. Please, Mr. Voles. I wait every day for the protagonists of these past two years to step in front of the camera and apologize to all of us. Me too. Yes. Exactly. Coming. We all know, now in the rearview mirror of history, that many decisions were arbitrary and disproportionate and above all harmful. And not just for the economy, but also for the psyche and for the children. And collateral damage is gigantic. Breach of law. Breach of law anyway, but it's only the basic law. Mr. Spahn even admitted it in his newly presented book. He wrote a book? Do not read. No, but regardless. Stop. Have him come and talk to us about it. Yes, exactly. But he never comes here. But let's see. Shall we make a bet? <laughs> yes, with pleasure. But the fact is, actually we all know, the proportionality was not given, in the aftermath of history it is well recognizable, and the damages are gigantic. Not only monetarily, but also socially. We have a divided society, everyone has someone in the family, in the circle of friends, with whom they no longer speak, and that's actually unforgivable, I think it's particularly bad what we did to the children. We see behavioral disorders, we see depression, we see very poor development, even in children, this is the future. The children are the future of this society, they should pay our pension. At the same time we've been driving up costs, I don't know how this country will cope financially with an aging society in the future, I'm really excited. The promised pension, whether it is tenable? Questionable. And it's exciting how, within 50 to 60 years, we have gone from the economic miracle to the heating blackout with power outages within a few months. In order to restore peace, I would wish that one or two politicians would step in front of the camera and say, that was wrong. And politicians are not willing to admit mistakes, they don't think to say, okay, maybe the euro thing was a stupid idea, or the lockdown thing. An apology is overdue, and I would really like to see that from the politicians. That would restore social peace, then we could build bridges again, talk to each other, and say that was stupid, but now we can pull together for a better future. In addition, a quote from Lord Ismay, the first NATO Secretary General, which I found while preparing for this broadcast. He said, the purpose of the NATO alliance is to keep the Russians out, the Americans in and the Germans down. Class. It is a quote from him. Shall I tell you something? I have now written a book about it. On Europe, on Ukraine, and we have, so to speak, brushed this forward in a very theoretic way. As I said, this was the 20th century, keep the Russians out, the Americans in, and Germans down. But on the 21st century, it should actually say, I know I'm getting a little burned myself now, get the Americans out, keep the Russians in, and lift Europe up. I don't want to open the debate now, of course I have written many pages about this to justify it, yes, this is a bit under complex now, but maybe you can read it soon. Very gladly. Mr. Voles, you are watching and I have the feeling that. Corona pandemic, I hope that it is over, that we are not threatened with a revival in autumn or winter. What bothered me, or us as an association during the entire discussion, also by individual measures hindering the economy, lockdowns with state-enforced business closures. The many good recommendations and advice came from university professors who are themselves alimented by the state, who never had to worry about what was left at the end of the month for themselves and for their employees. They did not have to bear the consequences of their actions. Also politicians who received their parliamentary and ministerial salaries and then made decisions that were not always well justified, that made many people very angry. 
nicht unbedingt immer fundiert gewesen sind. Und das hat sehr viele auch äh, sehr verärgert. Und was the youth was addressed. We also have cases of companies where the parents report that their children have witnessed at home how the existence fears have been discussed at the breakfast table. In the end, they are now preformed, they become optimal public servants in the civil service, they do not become independent. That's sad. Yeah. This means that the entire creativity of each individual is destroyed and in the end we all only manage each other. Creativity, which, by the way, is also expressed in numbers. I'm a fan of numbers and facts. Germany's largest SME financier, the Kreditanstalt for Wiederaufbau, regularly calculates the so-called innovator quota. This is the proportion of people aged 18 to 63 out of 100 who are self-employed. 15 years ago it was 4.0, or 4 people. At the beginning of Corona it was 0.06, E1 in 100 people between the ages of 18 and 63 is considering becoming self-employed. So we're getting fewer and fewer. And of those fewer and fewer, fewer and fewer are willing to become self-employed. And that is extremely unfortunate for a country like the Federal Republic of Germany, which has hardly any natural resources but only human capital. Very sad. This development throws us far behind and even extremely endangers the basis of our prosperity. May I? Regarding criticism of universities, I believe that if we are discussing the future here, I would always argue that the future starts with thinking. So to speak, global thinking, rethinking, and it is indeed, and here you are absolutely right in your criticism, which of course must not be blanket, that the universities today no longer offer precisely this space, the place and oasis of free thinking. But of course there is also commissioned work, compliance, private universities, third-party funding dependency and so on. I would actually put that on the table as criticism. I am not in the process of legitimizing the fact that there are individual reviewers who then write problematic reports. But I think the problem actually lies deeper. If we say we are an innovative society and innovation is our advantage, for example over China, Europe has always been a knowledge society, then the question arises as to what knowledge we are still generating. What knowledge, what thinking, what ability of thinking? So literally, what order of thinking do we have? In what terms do we think? World, society, democracy. What do we mean when we say democracy, and so on? I think it's clear to everyone, especially in this sejura, that this is not settled. Ask in the street what democracy is, 10 people, 20 answers. And these studies that are kind of problematic, I think the problem is bigger. The dependence on third-party funds at the universities is enormous. They don't really do anything anymore, except third-party funds. What does this lead to? To dependency. Not just for that, which is bad enough, but it just leads to one-dimensional thinking, e.g., political science, European studies, yes? We are all totally dependent on the drip of the European Union, they hand over these Horizon 2020 proposals, then the Commission just pretends, populism. And what happens? They make all sorts of proposals for populism, the best ones are chosen, it's a lottery anyway. In any case, an insane number of applications are written, some get through, the criteria are unclear. The research associations in Austria, by the way, they now admit that they get a hundred applications and two-thirds of them are rejected. The best third remains and a lot is drawn from this. As a scientist, one can of course ask oneself, why do I actually spend months writing a research proposal if there is a raffle at the end? I say all this because these are things that are not known, but of course they also have a chronically underfunded middle class at the universities, the academic councils, some doctoral students, who, by the way, don't actually earn much at all. Just for comparison, a 40-year-old sociologist with 10 years of teaching experience, with a doctorate, earns 1900 euros net. So it's no longer the case that universities are the very big privilege holders. Certainly, perhaps at the professorial level, but no longer at mid-level positions. This leads to very large dependencies. Many have one or two-year contracts, which always goes until the next doctoral thesis, then two years after and so on. But what does this lead to? As a result, no one writes a critical text anymore. You really don't want to write a thesis in which you say that Mrs. Merkel's European policy is not so good when you know for sure that it will be examined, that it is sorted out, so to speak. 
Yes, of course. And then of course you don't have to be surprised about this corona research, but what went wrong? Who paid for these studies? With what interest? What were the test groups and how big? Who conducted the clinical studies? Which articles were not printed? I can tell a lot about it. I am in the group, seven arguments, we are 80 scientists, we have partly tried our hand at correcting articles. Normally you have a scientific journal, there is something in it. In the next journal you write a critique of the article from the last journal. That doesn't get printed because it's too critical for a jury. The article is not rejected because it is critical, but because it does not formally fulfill some methodological things. That's exactly what happens in science, secretly, of course, I told too much insider knowledge. In my opinion, thinking and innovation must be maintained, and there are interesting studies on this. For example, there is a meta-study from Zurich with the title, The Sciences Are Losing the Best Minds that the bright minds have long since disappeared from the scientific community, so to speak. To industry. It already starts at school. Even earlier. Homogenization is about dependence on third parties, as I said. If you are dependent, you have to do populism. Because what is science? Science is curiosity. I make an observation and I want to explore it why. My curiosity, my topic. But if the commission now tells me that this year there will only be populism and I want to do legitimacy, then I know for sure that legitimacy is not enough for my three doctorates. Nor for the rent. Then we all do populism and then we all quote ourselves, and at the end there is intellectual incest. It's important to understand that, because we're losing the brightest minds in science right now. And the best minds are those who drive innovation and who then maybe build a medium-sized company. Ms. Schneider, in a moment. Mr. Vols now, please. Me too. As you just described, there is the Austrian economist Joseph Schumpeter creative destruction. Yes, exactly. If we do without it, it means stagnation and regression. And we are not on an island here, but in a huge global competition. Can you explain creative destruction? Replacing old with new, and new comes from creative creativity, the will to change and the willingness to face new tasks and things. Not only in terms of products and processes, but also new ideas and thoughts. Paradigm shifts, as in quantum physics, are these particles or waves, for example, and who debates theories, is the Earth flat? No, it turns. When does a new finding or new research cause a paradigm shift in science? And when we say we are at a turning point, and I think this is obvious in all social issues, then for me the only capital we have now beyond the financial bubble is thinking, thinking, thinking. And above all, rethink. And after Schumpeter's A Creative Destruction, old thinking has to be destroyed, so to speak, because we need a paradigm shift. This is really like Copernicus. And I think we're kind of in there without being able to put a name to where we're going to end up. So what's the idea that's taking the time? I think everyone intuitively feels that we are experiencing experiencing a paradigm shift here, a new era, and that we will never go back to the time before Corona. But what is dangerous, I think, is that many companies stop innovating because they no longer invest in Germany, because they have no security of supply, because they don't know where the price spiral for raw materials, electricity, and gas prices is going. And I keep hearing them say, we're going to stop the budgets for innovation and research because we don't know, will we still have today's gas prices in a year's time? Of course, this is a dangerous development and also a warning signal for me. Innovations have always driven Germany, we have always been the patent world champion, but now we have already lost out to Japan. But that is the backbone of Germany's SME sector. We have too many hidden champions like no other in the whole world, but they're just stopping investing, and that's a threat to the economy and to tax revenues. And one more thing to show that Germany is actually a wrong-way driver. We are the only ones in all of Europe with an infection control law. I was on service TV last week, I took the train, in Austria, without a mask. 
and at the border came the announcement, we are on German territory, please put on the mask. The whole train laughed, on the plane I can fly without a mask, and if we had caught the politicians. Did everyone do it? Of course not, but if we had caught the politicians on the train, we wouldn't have to wear a mask on the train any more than we would in the Wiesen tent. And it is also an extremely dangerous development for democracy and for social peace, because that is division. First of all, we are the only ones in Europe with the Infection Protection Act, which doesn't really make Germany attractive as an industrial location. I don't think foreign companies want to invest here, unless the euro gets even cheaper, then maybe. Second, we're the only ones shutting down the world's safest nuclear power plants. Everyone around us tunes in, Switzerland, Belgium, France, Poland want to build some, but we switch off, and make it even more stupid, that's really stupid to say we're making the reserve. We still have the costs, the staff, but we do not draw the electricity, because otherwise we will lose the election in Lower Saxony. And I have to agree with Sarah Wagenecht, this is the stupidest energy policy in the world, unparalleled in stupidity. And then the breaking news, Mr. Habeck wants to keep them running. Yes he will. Now he's awake. And that is precisely the problem when ideologically blinded lobbyists advise the Minister of Economics, who has no idea. That is precisely the problem. Excuse me, but I would bring in Ms. Schneider first. It was so many things. But first I have to collect myself. So, on the one hand, it is becoming increasingly difficult to provide training in Germany because we are getting fewer and fewer people who are willing to get their hands dirty, especially in manual trades. That must now be made quite clear, and Mrs. Garrett has come full circle. It's been a century since I went to school myself, but even then I felt that thinking was not wanted. Please only learn by heart and play the yellow reclam booklet, but please do not question and certainly not interpret differently, could make us work. I already had that back then, now I've accompanied three children through school myself, and I've always said, the time with the children was nice until they started school, then the nice time was over. I really felt that way. And that not only started in my time, but my children went to school in Bavaria, so the school system was maybe a little different than in Berlin, where I went to school. It was always supposedly a little easier there. Maybe that was it, I don't know. But even then I noticed that self-thinking children, and I have to specifically mention my son now because he was always a bit provocative and difficult, I would like to put it this way, he didn't have a chance at school. Yes, today the gifted children of rich parents can somehow get by. But jokes aside, the real question is, the real question is, when did we lose it? What is the reason? I would agree with their descriptions. I have two sons, but they went to school in France. But we did it, to put it 68, 69, summer of the theories, Adorno, all the universities that were raging. And if we look at it analytically, that was also a huge break, but something happened afterwards. After all, we went into the 70s as a changed society. Sex was suddenly free, whatever, what else did they do? Yes, feminism, anyway, we had changed divorce law away from the principle of guilt, and so on. The whole society has been kneaded through, and de facto liberalized in the 70s. And now the question is, what happened that a new society actually emerged via a student movement and a sejura, of which we would say today, that was actually quite relaxed in the 70s. Today we have it the other way around. At the universities, the students are my main critics. Open letter, student council, open letter, student parliament. So if I have problems at the university, then with the students. 
And something happened that the drivers of social renewal are no longer the young people, so to speak. And, and in the end the question arises. Where have we fundamentally, in all areas, lost the need for freedom? Because it must have been clear to the students and the companies involved, some of whom did not defend themselves, that we all lost at some point if we drifted into such a society. Where is the peace movement, the Greens of old? I'm going to give you a private example, but I have a very good friend in Berlin who actually lives in Prenzlauer Berg in a really exemplary way, everyone would say left-wing weirdo, former punk, squatter scene in the 80s 90s. And the funny thing is, for me he was always kind of against the state, against the police, against the big corporations. And now, we've fallen out, no more contact, because he's suddenly had an interesting transformation in the last two years. Suddenly he thinks war is good, he thinks we need to supply weapons, heavy weapons. I just thought, wow. Or he thinks, big pharma is good, he thinks big vaccinations are great and blindly believes in everything. He finds the politics right, which he always hated. He suddenly says, Spahn, Lauterbach, great people. And anyway, the government is great. And of course I ask and confront him with it, you are actually from the left spectrum, what happened that you suddenly agree with the war? That you believe the big corporations and accept without questioning everything that is served up to you? That's why the friendship broke up, but the fact is, we are experiencing this turning point, left is right, and right is left. What was the answer? There is no answer. Criticism, if it does not come from the left, is not allowed, that is the problem. We have lost our way ideologically. We live the deluded dogmatism, which is above pragmatism. Virtually everything is overheard, hubris is achieved, and everything is approved of. I'm not somehow conservative, but it seems that everything that is left is great, climate change, pronouns, gender equality, etc., and if you're against it, you're against us, if you're on the right, you're a Nazi. And that's what's wrong with the whole society. That's late Roman decadence, that's like Nero playing the violin beautifully, and it's burning around him. I would like to put it differently, because it was actually the task of the left, whether you like the squatters or the flora in Hamburg, where we are right now, whether you like the people now or not, but of course they have a social role because they did the institutionalized social criticism, they were always blamed for it, the black goat and so on. But if we didn't have them, we wouldn't have made various advances, criticism of capitalism and so on. That's what's happening now, that's what I've observed and described in my book. If the left no longer criticizes society, but the so-called right, whether AFD, FP, whatever, they are not allowed to do it because it is populism and anti-state activity, then we are without criticism. And no democracy survives that. As in Italy, I don't know who saw this clip of Maloney on the internet. It's actually not stupid what the woman says, but since it comes from her, it's frowned upon. Thus, as a society, we are losing the capacity for criticism that is actually the germ of our progress, as well as the germ of our new thinking. When the left no longer criticizes and the right is no longer allowed, then we become uncritical. And what happens then? Then we find ourselves in par-authoritarian structures because nobody criticizes anymore. We are all experiencing that right now. I think that started with the Merkel era. I would also say yes. By the way, one more sentence about the Merkel era. In the Merkel era, it really happened that we went from citizens to human beings. Willy Brandt spoke of citizens of this country. And the Merkel said, people in this country, that's very important, because of course I'm a human being, but for Mrs. Merkel I'm her citizen, which means that my relationship with Mrs. Merkel is a civil relationship, but not the fact that I am human and not an animal. And the moment we lost that category and we were no longer addressed as citizens like Brandt, but as the people of this country, we became exactly them, the people of this country. 
We have lost the semantic citizen salutation. Linguistically, we always bring about political change to some degree before we even notice it. Something else, for example, on the subject of citizens slash human beings. It has struck me for a long time that, as sovereign citizens, we constantly talk about being allowed to do something. My students at their presentation. Then they say sentences like, I was allowed to do an internship. Then I say, but did you do it? Say, I did the internship, you did it. We internalized it so much that we all immediately amaze something. Thank you for allowing me to sit here. Thank you for allowing me to give this talk. No. I've been working on giving this talk. The moment I expect in May, I expect permission from someone to do something. We anticipate the reformation of thought through language, that's what I mean. Mr. Voles, you can say something now. I listen to you enthusiastically. The economy and companies no longer make themselves the accomplices of the big political current, but they are the subject of the whole. For example, bureaucracy. Our costs continue to rise every year and we now have 52 billion euros in pure bureaucracy expenditure. The technical term is compliance costs for the entire German economy. In politics maneuvers through the so-called one-in, one-out regulation. This means that each new national bureaucratic regulation must lead to the disappearance of another, so that the burden does not increase. But this is all just window dressing, because the whole Brussels bureaucracy, what comes out of Brussels and gets passed into national legislation, all the directives that become national law, they are excluded, which means that the burden on the economy is growing every year. And that means fewer and fewer freedoms, fewer and fewer opportunities to make decisions. Space is becoming ever more restricted, and that makes entrepreneurial activity, you can confirm it, more and more difficult. That may be well-intentioned, but ultimately there is less freedom and more dirigism. How is the latest decision from Europe regarding the obligation to record working hours going? If it hasn't been clarified yet, is it enough if I do it by hand? Is an Excel spreadsheet enough? Do I have to go digital or introduce a time clock? A great example, the amendment to the Working Hours Act. We in Germany always have the unpleasant habit of going one better. Federal government sets the Federal Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs. Mr. Heil, by the way, works a lot in the background and is very successful with it. He would like to see only companies bound by collective agreements benefit from more flexible working hours. Article 93 of the Basic Law. However, medium-sized companies are generally less and less bound by collective agreements, do not belong to any employer's association and negotiate vacation pay and wages bilaterally with employees. This is a big problem, especially in the new federal states, but companies that want to take advantage of the opportunity to work more than 12 hours a day to cope with peak demand will not be allowed to do so under the draft law unless they are bound by collective bargaining agreements. So all those companies that are not bound by collective agreements are discriminated against here. And this is a good example of restricting corporate freedom. By what right? Why should the state impose tariffs? According to Article 93 of the Basic Law, the company itself can decide autonomously whether it wants to conduct collective bargaining or not. And if this flexibility only applies to companies that are subject to collective bargaining autonomy, then I think it is completely inappropriate to say that the state wants to give companies every possible freedom, because in day-to-day -day practice the opposite happens. Dass man alles Mögliche versucht, staatlicherseits den Unternehmen Freiräume zu gewähren, weil das Gegenteil ist die tägliche Praxis. When do you think it started? I have been a stakeholder of the middle class since 2003, and since then it has become more and more. And it is promised every year, the bureaucracy is getting less and less. Bureaucracy Reduction Law 1, 2, 3 and 4 failed last time because the Federal Ministry of Finance and Mr. Schultz's Federal Minister of Finance and Mr. Altmaier could not agree on what is to be given priority now, because neither of them allowed the other to be successful. That's why it basically failed. Some adjustments have been made here and there, but there has been practically no relief for companies. I'm going to step in here to perhaps shed some light on this from a different perspective. There is a lot of talk in political science about simulation democracy. 
We are talking about absolute legalization processes, which means that we pay a lot of attention to procedures, regulate procedures in ever more detail, what you just described in the economy, but of course also in all other processes, town meetings, and so on. This means that we are actually going through a process that actually leads to the regulation of everything that we use to regulate, so to speak, interpersonally. According to the civil code, a handshake is actually also a contract, and so so on. The trend towards juridification means, of course, that everything has to be process capable. Why? Because we as a society are clearly losing credibility. The last time I spoke to someone who works for a major insurance company and he said, previously, the board members would talk with whiskey and cigars about post-blizzard claims adjustment or something, what we would do and how. Today they only drink water, but there are now two lawyers behind every board member. And before the board makes a decision, his lawyers whisper in his ear that if you sign it now, you will be personally liable one way or the other. In other words, what you describe as a process of increasingly fragmented regulation I would generally describe as the beginning of great juridification processes, the capital code, and who makes the laws, which lobby groups, which influence groups, and so on. In general, I think it has become a huge undergrowth, we try to examine this undergrowth with transparency laws, and in the end everything becomes even more fragmented and we can hardly move a meter in this undergrowth. That's what you said about the entrepreneur who can no longer make a step without being bound by a collective bargaining agreement. I don't know how to solve this problem, it's always a question of a how. Throw away law books. Perhaps to briefly philosophize about the term of crisis, so to speak. But who would claim that crises can be overcome? If we now accept that we are in crisis as a society, I assume that everyone has had a life crisis, a marriage crisis or something. Yes, usually something happens and mostly one runs after crises. To put it very clearly, the following question arises for me. When we are at a turning point and want to rethink and streamline the processes, streamline the bureaucracy and make it reasonable, and we want to organize everything democratically, then the decisive question is, are we driven, or do we shape what is happening ourselves? For example, consider the reunification of Germany. Well, if we had wanted to make a unification treaty for 40 years, then Honecker and Kohl would have had plenty of time to sit down and say, we'll make a unification treaty. Instead, on November 9th, we witness a press conference where an Italian journalist asks Schabowski, when will the wall be open and for how long? And he turns the paper over three times and says, I don't know exactly, I think immediately. Let's assume now that that wasn't a sensible, long-prepared answer, it just happened. And then a crisis dynamic came about, which we captured well, successfully as a peaceful revolution and so on, unification treaty. I'm only saying that in this historical dimension because I really wanted to make this philosophical point again, whether crises can be stopped and managed at all, or whether this is somehow an avalanche-like event, my expression at the beginning. Here we are with her Friedrich cycles. We're going through that somehow, and we're still blaming politics for doing it badly, and so on. I don't want to legitimize anything with that. I would just like to approach a little story of humility that some things just develop their own momentum, or is the claim to decide everything a false claim. As I said, nothing was initially decided on November 9th, but it happened. And then we successfully tracked the events and captured them within a year and that was it. And the fact is, at least for me, that we are in a regulatory frenzy, that we are being rushed into something and our decision-making power is being completely taken away from us. And I also find that interesting, where did it start, that we are no longer able to decide for ourselves and that we have switched to a fully comprehensive mentality, where we somehow almost expect that something will be decided for us, like us then have to do it and leave it alone. I think that's terrible.
es dann zu tun und zu lassen haben. Ich finde das furchtbar. There I am with you. I also do not have a clear answer to this question, so I guess. It started with Mommy. With Mom Merkel. Is also interesting that we call her Mom. Incapacitation that the country now needs a mother, we need a mother. Mrs. Merkel is not a woman, but I compared it in an article. Has no children. Ms. Merkel has no children, yes. But for example Ségolène Royal, I don't know who remembers her as a candidate for the French presidency, in 2008 against Sarkozy, in her poncho and high heels as she traveled around the country. The question, of course, is real, why don't we need a woman, in the sense of an elegant woman in high heels and so on, at the head of state, like the French would have with Ségolène Royal? Why do we have a imam? Yes, that is actually an infantilization, so to speak. A psychogram. Exactly, a psychogram, and I think so. Mrs. Schaefer is not in politics. We now need psychoanalysts at the table. But actually, so it actually came into being, in my view, with Mutti Merkel. We have mutated from responsible citizens to immature citizens, and thought, Mama will fix it. Whether it was the financial crisis, the euro crisis, the refugee crisis, it was always, Mama Mama Mama, and of course at the beginning of the corona crisis. And why did we let it be done to us? That is a good question, Mrs. Schneider. That's the question. Why? There is the applause. Applause for the question. Very good question. I think it was a mixture, in my opinion, that we as a people were just satiated, then this guilt complex that still prevails, and then of course propaganda. But the guilt complex doesn't rule. We hear it every day at the moment. The effect is noticeable. Of course, because we grew up with it and it was always hammered into us like crazy. I'll never forget it. Can I answer differently? Please. We were just too comfortable and too full. So 70 years of the Federal Republic, that means, so to speak, the whole fat belly of the Federal Republic, so to speak, everyone who was born into the prosperous Federal Republic, who have two or three houses, that is, all the assets in this country, you can see that. And the problem then is, who has a need for change? So political processes only take place if enough people want it. Example Corona, two-thirds are still doing all this, one-third would like something else, that is, who is affected? Concern awakens the desire for change. In this respect, I would actually want to explain this crisis event, loss of freedom, regulation mania and so on, at least in part with fat belly and habit. That those who carry the country have felt no need to change anything for many years. Because it was just beautiful, for most people. The comfort zone. Exactly. Everyone knows this from their own life, when you are doing well, no one likes to change habits. That's the way it is, we like what we know. It is extremely difficult for us, as brain research can prove, something new is initially a threat to us. When you're over 45, neurologically it's like skiing, you're always skiing into the slopes of those who have gone before you. It's just as hard for a country to get out of that. We have now skied for 70 years on the tracks of the Federal Republic, it was very comfortable, and all of a sudden we are supposed to change habits. Mr. Voles. The term saturated has already been mentioned. This welfare state promise is very convenient for politicians. It promises the citizen in elections that it will be distributed even better, even more, and that it will depend even less on individual performance, but it is the state that cares for him. And if you as a politician take the opposite course, and Mrs. Merkel has had this experience once, and then lost an election, then you just let it be. Then you know that the successful course in politics is the promise of social benefits. Agenda 2010, Gerhard Schroeder. Challenge and encourage. Now it's reversed. The indication that we are committed to the unconditional basic income that has now been decided for the coming year and that, to my great astonishment, even the FDP took part, that is exactly a development in this direction. Less and less is being asked of the citizens, they are being promised more and more. But when will the string burst? When will companies go to the barricades? 
We saw it in the car industry, our strongest economy, as it was always called, our car industry, did not defend itself with anything. They put up with everything. Well, then we'll switch to e-cars, it doesn't matter if a couple of heaters now cause the power grid to collapse, but we're building e-cars now. Where was the automotive industry when it started? Volkswagen is a large corporation. But what about medium-sized companies? So are there protests there now too? That's yes, excuse me, but it was like with the artists, or even the intellectuals, where one always wondered, you are many, where are you? Why don't you get in touch? Why don't you say anything? Why? Why don't you show your faces? That doesn't mean that you have to organize a demonstration somehow. There is still a lot of educational work to be done. For my association, I can say that we have shown a lot of face and have also made unpopular demands. But the established associations in particular, you mentioned them earlier, are pretty much in agreement with the state. The Confederation of German Employers is the collective bargaining partner, the social partner together with the trade unions. And they basically have no interest in causing any great unrest. They want to lead to a mutually acceptable outcome in their circles. Therefore, when companies are bound by collective bargaining, historically they have not done much when there have been union demands that have not been met by productivity gains. There was the productivity whip, labor was replaced by capital. And at Volkswagen in particular, there is a company that is partly owned by the state, and the decisions that were made there were always with great consideration for the Works Council. The party book is a problem everywhere, many have one. I would open a controversial flank here. State, redistribution and so on. I actually think this is a very popular argument. Sure, redistribution has to be paid for and earned by someone, it's solid, of course, it has to be. Still, I don't think that's where the big chunk is. If you look at it closely, these social stories are mostly about what you pay, of course, for health insurance, unemployment insurance, pension insurance. If you look closely at the Hartz Beer area really down there, it takes a while before they get an increase of 10 euros. But that's not a large sum. It is therefore always an easy argument to say that it is due to social redistribution. I think if you look at it that way, you actually have a lot to do with salaries, for example, but not with wealth. Those are the very important debates, where is the money actually, where should it actually be redistributed? Of course we distribute from the middle class downwards, but we don't look all the way up either. So the actual construction sites are elsewhere. Where, and then I always find it a bit too quick that we slide into the social divide. There are very good social science studies that show that people can no longer get out of the hearts for milieu. It's not that everyone likes being there, but that has now been passed on to the second or third generation. There is also the habit. If the father doesn't get up in the morning, the son doesn't get up either, and so on. I have a bit of a hard time blaming these people, I really feel sorry for them, because once they're there, you can't get out of a spiral like that. It starts with who actually reads something to the child, does mom still cook? What is social capital, so to speak? And as a very rich society, we allow ourselves to have child poverty today. Although we are much wealthier as a country, we have far more child poverty today than in the 1970s. That is the question, why? We are a great country, much richer than in the 1970s. Why do we now have 70 children per thousand in poverty and not one? I don't know if the number is correct, but in any case it has accelerated many times times over. I think there are a lot of mechanisms at work that we as a society can't want. Because if you and you want to have people in the middle class who are well educated, who can do math and write, then we can't lose those kids. We can't, because that's the future of the republic, and I think we're talking about 20% here. Pulling these children out of social capital and basic political participation is fatal. We have 78% of Hearts for recipients who don't vote because they are convinced that their vote doesn't count anyway. That may indeed be true, but if they all voted, we might have a different impact on the elections. This means that if we take democracy seriously, political and social participation is very important. That's why I'm having a hard time with this socially scolding argument. Mr. Voles, you answer. 
I have in no way advocated leaving the situation as it is. On the contrary, if you create enough incentives, I think you can mobilize some parts, certainly not all, to take up work and become a productive part of our society. Everyone should have that opportunity, and if the state creates the opportunities for that, I'm pretty sure in terms of incentive funding, then a certain amount will actually make the leap. But let's look at the numbers. We have a federal budget of almost 495 billion euros. 165 billion goes to work and social affairs. Of this, again in the coming century, 12 billion euros for the pension. These are all investments in the past, not investments in the future. Well, I don't think we have a good starting point for achieving the ecological and social restructuring that the coalition parties have promised, completely different amounts are needed for that. So we should not only invest in consumption, but in investments, public and private. We have a lot of catching up to do there. Yes, so education, education, education. What I have observed in recent years, Mr. Vols may be able to confirm. I think it's great how it works by itself. So I thought about it, I'm thrilled, so to speak, I was just thinking about buying an admission ticket later. Perhaps you also have your own opinion? <laughs> What I have observed over the years is that we are seeing more and more command economy and socialism, and I find that very disturbing. Not only from the EU, but actually also from the federal government. Of course we now have socialists in the chancellery and in the government, but the fact is, on the one hand it's more and more about redistribution, but also, I think, about a certain dependency. The citizen money the best example. If you do the math, even if a secretary in Hamburg, for example, earns 3,000 euros, she doesn't actually have to work anymore. If she has two children, is a single parent, gets housing benefit and everything, then she might have one to 200 euros less. We simply see the state making its own voters compliant, so to speak, and of course the compliant citizens who depend on the state do not take to the streets. No one bites the hand that feeds him. This means that if we become more and more dependent on the state, we will never again be responsible citizens and will not take to the streets anyway if we are defamed as right-wing radicals or Nazis. Nor do we question the system, because we depend on it. And that's just like George Orwell. We have an entrepreneur at the table, and I would be interested, Mrs. Schneider, how many times in the last two or three years have you thought about saying that I'm fed up because I don't want that anymore, I'm actually closing my shop now and keeping looking. It's still a lot of fun for me because I have really, really great employees who I really enjoy working with. And who, strangely enough, also have a great understanding of the fact that our company cannot afford the salaries and wages that larger corporations can, but that we are just so limited in our options that I say we have the choice between pest and cholera. We don't pay horrendous wages because otherwise we'll go broke. Today they say file for bankruptcy. Produce less. <laughs> Produce less and still not do it in-house. Locking up and not being able to pay. In this respect, I have really, really great employees and I don't have to give up on that. But I'll also say quite honestly that over the past year and a half I've said to every single employee, to be honest, my friend, if you stop working and go to the employment office and then after a year get hearts for and, right now at a time when energy costs are rising so much, you also get the heating paid for and don't have to sit in the building at 19 degrees, stop working. Wage gap requirement has been a big issue for at least 10 years, by the way, I was also a single mother for years, by the way. So when we say we have to rethink everything, 
and then I think we have to think again about what work actually is. Or to put it another way, what work is supposed to be in the 21st century. Because we've been in agrarian society for the last hundred years, let's say since the beginning of the 19th century. Then everyone went into industry, so from the agrarian society to the industrial society, from the industrial society to the service society, and now to some algorithm, robotic society. The Marxists no longer exist today, they have always said that the substructure determines the superstructure. That means what the socio-economic structure is on the ground, so to speak, trades for example, that determines the democracy and the superstructure that we have. When we were still an agrarian society, we had feudalism, we had some landowners and maids and servants. After that we are in an industrial society, where we had strong trade unions and strong employers, with working capital and with strikes. And then we became a service company, everything has already changed. The question is, what economic substructure will we have tomorrow in order to have what democracy as the superstructure? I don't know, but I think that's the most important question we have to ask ourselves. And that question simply involves the notion of work. Because we do relationship work, child labor, not child labor, but we work with our children, yes, educational work. Sorry, parenting. Educational work, relationship work, gainful employment. I can already see the the entry on Wikipedia, Miss Garrett calls for child labor. <laughs> My Wikipedia entry can no longer be saved. So really. But for me that's the crucial question if we now have what you both complain about, the loss of medium-sized companies, location-based and so on. And we do Google, Metaverse, algorithms and so on, then the question is, what do we define as work? And that's what we're doing right now, for example, through the smallest of stories, with Zoom and working from home. So what is work now? How do we now realize the Zoom age, so to speak, in terms of trade unions? I'm looking forward to the painter painting my room via video link. <laughs> I'm only half joking, but I think that's the biggest question we have right now. What's the point of work if we replace it with robots? What remains to be done? Who else is qualified? Who can we qualify? What can and do we want to replace with digitization processes? And how do we then define work processes and socioeconomic structures that enable us which democracy? I would like to pass this question on to Mr. Voles. Oscar Lafontaine, think what you will of him, but he spoke the truth, we can't just cut each other's hair and hope that we can survive that way. The German economy will continue to have to have a base in the manufacturing sector. We depend on creating values that are bought in other countries. We must continue to have the export model in Germany, and the conditions for this must be created. The business model we have had so far, cheap energy, highly qualified work, high quality products, that alone will not be enough. We're going to have to keep tackling things that aren't just short-term trends, but enduring trends, like artificial intelligence as a technology, to keep up. There will be no other way for us. This tertiarization will not exist in the long run. We must move forward and face things that may seem far away now. Digitization will ultimately be inevitable, that is a general trend worldwide. And we don't live on an island and rely on being able to keep up with others. And we can only do that if we play by the same rules. Unfortunately, we are no longer able to set the rules of the game worldwide. That happened with the First World War, when the German language was no longer the language of science. In einer Situation zu sein, wo wir weltweit Spielregeln vorgeben können. Das hat sie mit dem Ersten Weltkrieg erledigt, als die deutsche Sprache nicht mehr die Wissenschaftssprache gewesen ist. I find it incredibly sad. In the past, much earlier, when you asked a child at school what they wanted to be when they grew up, there were actually statements like, I'll be a car mechanic or I'll build motorcycles. Today they sit in front of their computer games and say, I'm going to be a web designer. 
We still need key industries, not just industries, but also, as you say, key trades, etc. That doesn't work digitally, it just doesn't work. I think the consequence is that we need more humanity again and we have to be careful not to lose it completely. Since there will also be areas in the future, I think you want to go there where you need people. But there are enough activities where you can really ask yourself and have to say that digitization doesn't mean an end, it might be handy if the bus can drive autonomously. Or artificial intelligence instead of professional politicians. Yes, I'm in. Very good. <laughs> Bit of a joke, but actually, I totally agree with Mr. Vols. We have no raw materials, our own only raw material is really our brains. We are a country of engineers, poets and thinkers, which means we have to reinvent ourselves. Because a hundred years ago there were professions that no longer exist today, and in a hundred years it will probably be the case that there will no longer be car manufacturers in a hundred years because we fly or something similar. To think that the current status quo is set in stone for all eternity is hubris. There is constant evolution. If we look at what has happened in the last 10 or 15 years, digitization has completely changed the world. There used to be a typewriter, a voice recorder and the post office, but today everyone has this little black thing. But isn't that basically also being forced from the outside to prevent these innovations from taking hold? This is an area where I don't want to use the nasty word conspiracy theory. No, nobody can define that. What is a conspiracy theory? Conspiracy theory is what's reality in about six months. My experience over the last few years. Nowadays, when you hear conspiracy theory, you have to deal with it especially, because there is always a lot of truth in it. But back to the question, we have all noticed that this digitization is dividing us as a society, as people. A nice example, when I flew to Hamburg yesterday, I was first on the train, then on the plane, always without a mask. Not say. It used to be a get-together in a train compartment or on an airplane. You talked to each other, there was an exchange, newspapers were still read, you still had to complain when the neighbor held the newspaper in front of you. Meanwhile, dead silence, and all just like that. Everyone bent over and had this typical movement, and the young people here still do it like that. So these digital devices have given us an incredible amount of freedom and knowledge and access to new worlds. But they have completely divided us as a society. Even the empathy was taken. But they have also created the possibility that something like this is possible here, that Ms. Schneider can express her protest virally via the internet. All right, there are always two sides of the coin, there is good and bad. We have to push the good, and we should discuss the bad to talk about how to deal with it. A check. Exactly, because this digitization can also be used against people, civil liberties and democracy. You can be defamed on the internet, on Wikipedia for example, anything is possible. There are always two sides of the coin, there is no one who has the only truth. Mr. Vols, sorry. The appreciation of people who bear entrepreneurial responsibility must increase. The best example in Der Tatort, the crook in the screenplay is always the businessman, preferably from the construction industry. In the rarest of cases, it is actually someone else. The official. Unless he runs a test center. <laughs> Anyone who occasionally watches Acton's Icon's Eye will find that they are actually always the kidnapped, the beaten, the victim of car theft, and never actually the perpetrator. Reality and what is conveyed in the media are so far apart, and I would like the opposite to be the case more often, that it is presented differently. I want to make the comparison, the atomic bomb was invented in the last century and what did we do? The physicists go to the madhouse and ask what did we invent? And then humanity faces the real problem, namely, can we distinguish between good use and bad use? Good use led to the nuclear power plants we still talk about today. Bad use led to the nuclear weapons that we have controlled in the NPT for over a hundred years, and so on. 
If we now say that the atomic bomb was the invention that terrorized humanity somewhere in the last century, the 20th century paradigm, so to speak, then we could say the 21st century paradigm, i.e., the technology that presents us with the same challenge, where do we find the good and the bad side? The good side is that critics of the measures could be found on the internet. Suddenly we were able to make contacts, completely new networks, etc. So find each other, that's the good thing. Probably also the good side of a participatory democracy. Participation like the Pirate Party has already tried with voting by mobile phone, and so on. But where is the bad side, the abuse side on the internet that we need to channel, like we did back in the last century with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty? That didn't do us any good, as we're seeing right now, but maybe we'll at least come back. The bad side is seen in China, social credit program. Yes, that's what I meant. There is the part with the health certificate. You saw that critics of the measures or even critics of the Communist Party simply could not leave their block of flats. Or with the banks, there was great unrest about about the banks in China, many investors lost money there, then wanted to organize protests and then simply couldn't book any more train tickets because their health certificate had changed from green to orange or red. And then it's over. Lauterbach wants that. Hence the traffic light government. The only problem is that the government is a disaster. Again, we have now discussed economics, you recommended digitization to Ms. Schneider, one must not be late and so on. I agree, you need economic and technological progress. But my question is, which political system does technological progress bring? That was my base superstructure thesis. That means we can look at it from an economic point of view and say that we need this digitization, but the second question is, which society will the result be? Which person? Which image of man? I wrote in my book, Right to Analog Life. I'd like to say that to the camera again. But the most important fight we are doing is, in the UN Charter, the first sentence from the French Revolution is, all human beings are born equal and free, with dignity and rights. This sentence of 1789 ended up in the United Nations Charter in 1940. In my opinion, we should succeed in writing under this sentence the sentence that we have a right to an analog life with so social participation. This means that we can digitize but still retain the parallel structures of the analog and thus of the human. That is to say, we are actually preventing humanity from simply knocking over the ladder, so to speak, with the help of the UN Charter, and we are not coming down from the metaverse, that's what I mean. In this respect, my plea would be, if we want to preserve humanity, empathy, if we want to prevent atomization, we need a right to analog life and not in such a way that those who want to live analog without a smartphone all have to sit in a tree, but we must be able to lead an analog life and as sovereign citizens to be able to decide freely, also with regard to cash say, I want the right to live without a smartphone. When you see the development, especially globalization and prosperity through progress, I think most people don't want to live analog, they want to live digital. I think there is a counter-movement. I was at a lecture in Leipzig the other day, then in Brandenburg, with committed parents who say they are founding, no vaccination and smartphone of schools. They say we want schools without vaccination and cell phones. And I think that's quite important to say, I'm not in favor of doing away with all that altogether. What I'm saying is, when do you create the dependency structures? If we now have two-year-olds who are just swiping, what is actually taking place in the minds? What neurological formation is being formed? Let's be very banal for a moment, the internet does not know pages. I can't say internet article page 5 below. In a book, I have a page, I can refer to it. On the internet, I don't have a continuous text. 
The question is, what does it actually change in my neurological structures when I can no longer assign that? What does it change when I have a book that has a table of contents and an outline, and I can say, okay, I want to read Article X now, Chapter 2, that starts on page 73. And what does it do to me if I'm just browsing and I don't have that structure at all? That's what I was just talking about. I said that new questions arise about what thinking actually is and how we think. Or what technology does to us to make us think differently. And that's why I would actually make a plea, or at least I have the feeling that the older generation, so to speak, can somehow still use this cell phone to some extent, if not as well, but at least we still know it the old way. I experience that those who grow into these internet stories without knowing the book beforehand actually think differently. I notice very clearly that there are any breaks, and the break is, for example, that no one can contextualize it anymore. What was before no longer exists. I wipe on the internet, and then this happens. And then such discourses come out that the Russian war of aggression started exactly on the 24th of February, and not a second earlier. And I think these things actually have something to do with the way we think and take in information today, which is in floating text, so to speak. Let me try this too. We've gotten off topic a bit, but still, that's exactly what it's there for, that there are exactly these possibilities, because those are important aspects of the whole thing. Because what just popped into my head was the question, does this mean we're losing humanity? So are we becoming robots ourselves by depending on these devices all the time and not being aware of the outside around us? And above all, and this is important to me, no longer perceive our feelings. And with that, I want to bring that back to the present day, with a quote from Liz Truss, who when asked if she would use nuclear weapons, said, I think it's an important duty of the Prime Minister, and I'm willing to do that to do. Waffen einsetzen würde, geantwortet hat. Ich habe das Zitat hier. Ich denke, es ist eine wichtige Pflicht des Premierministers und ich bin bereit, das zu tun. Ich I'm ready to do it, she repeated, to applause from the assembled Tories. So I think what kind of people are in these positions that say they're ready to do this and still get applause for it? In diesen Positionen, die sagen, sie sind bereit, das zu tun, aber eben auch Applaus noch dafür zu bekommen. There is no alternative to this answer, otherwise the whole nuclear deterrent would not work. If she had said the opposite, then the nuclear deterrent, at least as far as Great Britain is concerned, would have been gone immediately. But with what coldness, with what composure? I saw this video, it's scary. So that's for me, I think that's for me now. I don't mean that politically at all, I haven't even dealt with this woman, I can't really place her. But humanly it comes across as cold, just as unempathetic, just as inhuman as what I perceive in our politics. It has been researched in the meantime, I have also raised two sons who constantly played computer games, who constantly shot with some man and got credit points for it, Empire Earth or what all the games are called. I think what happened there is, of course, the transmission. If we look at how wars are fought today, a big topic is drones. You're sitting somewhere and somewhere a drone shoots, and you don't even literally have to go into battle anymore. The transmission of the internet to learn to perceive that when you do these war games, computer games with real drones, in reality, that something is really happening and that people are really getting hurt. I actually think there is something neurological going on. This transmission in male adolescence is explored by asking the question, do you know that when I press here something happens somewhere? Is that still related to empathy? And the other thing, that was her question, what happens with this digitization, and do we lose humanity? I would answer yes, of course. Why? First, in Zoom we are two-dimensional, we are just a two-dimensional tile. And what else? You just said we're losing that feeling. We are in the process of losing our senses. We no longer smell and taste on the internet. But when we lose our senses, it's without meaning, and that's the point. 
That's why it's called senseless, because actually we think we grasp everything cognitively, but that's not true. We actually know that we learn through feelings. Stove top, every mother knows this. Don't touch the stove top. Said five times, touched once, learning experience. That is, we actually know that de facto we learn faster and better through our senses than cognitively. I always have to balance that out then, it's that famous book of thinking fast, thinking slow, but we've all had that experience. Without senses we can't evaluate at all, that means I just met you, and within five seconds my brain said, you are likable, so I can trust you. Thanks. <laughs> it was different for me. <laughs> That's why I'm sitting so far away. How to be in love. As soon as you enter the room, something happened even before we have made an analytical judgment. If we don't have that in the tile, then it actually becomes pointless. Because we will soon have glasses on for the metaverse, we already have the mask on our mouths anyway. We have the buttons in our ears. There is not much left to be able to somehow perceive anything with our senses. And then the real question is what kind of thinking emerges from it and how we then deal with society. But not necessarily. Everyone is free to decide whether they want to wear such glasses. The mask is different if you fly with Lufthansa. Everyone is free to do so. There is no inevitable development that this will happen and that one day everyone will be walking around with glasses like this. I find that a bit far-fetched. It's about having opportunities and being able to use them. Don't have to, may. I said that, too. I'm actually with Mr. Voles, that's why I looked a bit strange beforehand, Ms. Garrett, because I don't think we need a cap and regulation again, as you called it, the right to analog life. Yes, we have that, I'm totally with you on that. But it sounds like it has to be written in some legal text again, because you also mentioned the UN Charter, and for me there is already way too much in there everywhere. I am not a church person at all, not at all. I am baptized, but that's all. But if we simply take the Ten Commandments and live by them, then we wouldn't need such lengthy legal texts. The basic law is great, it just needs to be applied. Especially so thin. I'm really, like I said before, I'm totally against this fully comprehensive mentality and against putting everything in some law or sentence somewhere to tell people how to live and what to do. That's not what I meant. What I mean is, if you go to the supermarket in the UK or Paris, for example, nobody is there anymore. There's only one bouncer, you check in with your phone, you pack things things right at the supermarket, it's sort of tracked, and basically you check out yourself. It's just inventory, there's no little three-word conversation with the clerk or with the cashier, an older woman giving change, and so on, it's all gone. Yes, now the question is, is it economical? Yes, definitely. These are probably modernization processes that we need. But the question I wanted to ask and you asked, is the interpersonal lost? If the supermarket is actually a department store, but the question is, do I absolutely need my cell phone to shop in this supermarket? But that could also be a chance for the old corner shops to rediscover themselves. It's always supply and demand. Someone makes the offer, we're also talking about the masks, if nobody wore them, then they could still make so many decisions. Imagine it's mandatory masking and no one joins in, I've always said. But we all took part, we all took part. Would you like to? You look for your niche. That's how it is with the approximately 2,700 champions worldwide, around 1,375 Germans. They each have their niche, they're not world-renowned companies. But in the area in which they offer their products and services they are almost second to none and therefore I think that there will still be certain freedoms in the future, regardless of global developments that will prevail worldwide. And I believe that German companies, especially medium-sized companies, have actually been excellent providers of such products and services in the past.
So I'm a big friend of freedom, democracy and liberalism, people should be free to decide what we are allowed to do. We need less government, fewer regulations, I'm completely with you, we need more individual freedom, so that everyone can freely decide where they want to work, etc. In my opinion, digitization cannot be stopped either, it will be part of this society, and as a free movement, as free citizens, we naturally have the opportunity to decide where the journey should go. How much will digitization influence us? How far do I want to let it penetrate my life? I simply believe that we need less government, fewer regulations, less socialism and a planned economy. We need a market economy, freedom and capitalism once again. And I also believe that the current government structure and system structure are also in a transformation process, that we are also seeing an evolution. We won't have this democracy that we have now in 20 or 30 years, hopefully we will have something better and we will make it positive and constructive. And digitization will probably help us to have a grassroots democracy where everyone can vote with their cell phone or something. I was about to say, but you can't do that either. That was my thing, what superstructure arises on what sociology? Exactly, but that every individual, and by that I mean every single citizen of this country, is willing to take on more responsibility. Don't tick something every four years and think that those up there should do it, that maybe it won't work in this form anymore. But that's exactly what we're doing now. We have now had a major citizens consultation at European Union level, whether it is good or bad is not the issue. We do citizen proceedings, citizens meetings, that's ultra-modern, so to speak. Look at the trials with Macron, with the climate bills, where all these town hall meetings have been, same thing in the UK. That means we are moving in the direction of participatory democracy, the trend of the time. The concern I have is that we are replacing rights with participation, so to speak. Once everyone has participated, you can no longer be against the result. And that is actually the problem of this so-called simulative democracy. Is it still about citizens getting their rights, whatever rights they want, whatever they are fighting for? Or is it a simulation, so to speak, because you were there, you voted, now you can no longer be against it? This is the double bottom of this process, so to speak. And then there's how do we ensure that those who are not privileged, that is, the 78% of Hearts 4 recipients who do not go to the polls. How do we make sure they're involved in these citizen processes? There are studies on this subject that say that even if you make a standardized selection and anyone can come, and the distribution is even, in the end only those who can speak well go to vote. Confident people who believe they can communicate at eye level and are not excluded. This means that they then have the same statistical distribution, namely the middle class sits in citizens' assemblies and the socially disadvantaged do not sit there. That means they don't go to elections, but they don't sit in town meetings either. Another important issue is how we can ensure that this is not manipulated by large corporations or lobbyists. Another important issue is that the European Central Bank, for example, has now commissioned large corporations to create the digital euro, such as Amazon. I find that extremely dangerous because after all it is our money and none of us have legitimately authorized the ECB to deal with it in any way. The fact that the digital euro is to be produced and spent by digital corporations is very questionable. And here we come to cash, cash is coin freedom, we must not say goodbye to it, even if it was considered dirty and a virus carrier during Corona. So you see that politicians like to use every crisis to eliminate the undesirable. I just looked at my slip and thought the show was called Energy and Inflation. <laughs> and I would like to talk about it again in the last quarter of an hour, and above all dare to look ahead. Mr. Voles, if you look at what's in store for us, you said you also have contacts in politics. You know the one. Is there any hope that this, I'll call it a billing nightmare at the moment, which most people are suffering right now, can somehow be cushioned or what? 
There is an urgent need for a unified line within the federal government in order to create clarity and finally put an end to this apparent lack of orientation. Earlier Mr. Friedrich described very nicely what conditions prevail there and how they appear to the outside world without frills. They must finally be ended, decisions must be made that really help. The economy would primarily help to improve the liquidity situation, for example making it easier for companies to offset losses. Losses made now should be able to be offset against profits made before the corona pandemic. That tax prepayments are temporarily suspended. After all, it's hard to see why companies should pay taxes now for developments that might occur in the future. The opposite should be the case. The Fuel Emissions Trading Act, for example, this CO2 tax on the consumption of fossil goods is to be postponed by a year, or the increase of 5 euros from 30 to 35 euros is to be postponed by one year. What we really need now is a suspension of these CO2 prices. Corporate tax reform is long overdue. In Germany, we have a little over 30% in total corporate taxes, but worldwide it is only 25%, maybe 28%, that enable competitiveness. Nothing at all is being done in this area. The solidarity surcharge is also still levied on partnerships, the top 10%, and that too must be abolished. But do you have any hope that this will happen? I tried to get around that with my response. <laughs> That's why I asked again, so no. <laughs> Was that a no? I think Mr. Stoiber once said, he believes less and less and hopes more and more, my answer went a bit in that direction. It is the normative power of the factual. If the numbers continue to fall, if unemployment shoots up, if the shortage of skilled workers and workers doesn't hide it, but if the burden on social insurance actually shoots up, then the pressure to act will remain great at the beginning of the Millennium Agenda 2010. Then politicians suddenly come to insights that have long been known in specialist circles and are urgently called for, but are not implemented for obvious reasons, not out of fear of the voters. Yes, except that you have just quoted Schumpeter. All this is based on the assumption of control capability. I mean that quite analytically, what do we control in such moments of crisis, where, as Mr. Friedrich just said, we race from one crisis to the next, decisions are made ever faster, ever more detailed, what is steering ability? I do not know it. They say the pressure to act must increase and it will not increase because, so to speak, people do not want to be expected to make decisions that they disapprove of. That's one assumption, but when we say we're in a turning point, I would first of all want to say very analytically that turning points and systems can sometimes tear. The assumption that we always catch and control everything is an assumption, and if you look back in history you can see that it wasn't always like that. What we call history today is nothing other than the fact that at some point we realized that something happened in 1870, mostly with wars, 1914, then 1930, whatever. What we call history are sejuras that we can only name when the sejura period is over. If you can say in historical retrospect, something started in 2020 and ended in 2045, or whatever, 2025. I hope that was a slip of the tongue. 1918, 1945, historical research now speaks of the 30 years war. But the internet has made everything faster. Then let's say 15 years, then we're at 35. Take a look at what moments of crisis, phases of upheaval are, so to speak. And if we say now, we're in there somewhere. So 35 more years. I don't know. I think, then I would be 60. No, the only point. Mr. Habeck, mathematics. The only point I wanted to say, on which I agree with Mr. Vols, is to say, on what assumption are we discussing this? Is there any assumption that will catch that? I don't know that. What do you say? Small and medium-sized companies like things to be specific, which is why I make specific suggestions. And it's also important for me to point out that it might not be the last word, if politicians or the federal government say we can't do this or that. 
dieses oder jenes können wir nicht mit I refer to Brussels. Brussels law might not allow that if you then get infringement proceedings. The current situation is that the electricity tax in Germany for commercially used electricity is 40 times higher than the minimum level set by the EU. For private households, it is 20 times higher. What is stopping the German government from making this decision overnight to go down to the European level? That would be an immediate relief, it would be felt immediately. There are examples, Macron. Macron is capping gas, Macron is capping energy, Macron is doing this. Mr. Friedrich, crises mean changes. We are in this process of change, transformation, which we all feel, and we are experiencing a turning point. Crises are opportunities, so we all learn from crises. Everyone can discover on their own biography, the biggest learning effect we had in a crisis, marriage crisis, relationship crisis, economic crisis etc. Now we have a social crisis, we have a global crisis, and we will overcome it together. We just have to find new ways, we must not cling to the old ways, we must abandon old paths and strike out in new directions, and our current policy is not ready for that. Or they may not be intellectually equipped to do it, or they lack the courage and fear alienating their own constituents. But if we continue like this, we will drive the cart completely against the wall, which means social unrest, impoverishment, loss of wealth. We will no longer see the prosperity that our parents and grandparents built up. That means Germany is leaving this cycle of unbelievable prosperity and we are simply getting poorer. And that is the great danger I see, because such upheavals in cycles never go peacefully. Then there are either revolutions or wars, and I have shown very clearly in the last book how these cycles always repeat themselves mathematically. This has been comprehensible for 2000 years, every 70, 80, 90 years there is a cycle of upheaval, a new monetary system, a new social orientation, and we are in the middle of it. We can't stop it, then politicians can do what they want, the ECB can print as much money as they like, you can't shelve cosmic laws. Printing money has never solved a crisis or created wealth, it has always had the opposite effect. This is the law of resonance. That means we will have big problems that can be solved, but not with the current policy or with the current mindset. And we will have to make a kind of leap in consciousness through the next crisis, as a society, as humanity, otherwise we will unfortunately get into trouble for the time being. And the book on the subject is Buddenbrooks. One generation begins, one builds up, and one gambles away. Because it no longer has any memory of the difficulty of the construction. Exactly, the generation that experienced the last great crisis, the war, up until 1945 is dead. Anyone who knows it, knows it from stories or books. And each generation has its own baggage to carry, which means that we are constantly drawn into armed conflicts, which is why we also feel the current familiar system in which we were comfortable collapsing at every nook and cranny. Of course, the protagonists who profit from this system are trying to keep this system alive because they know very well that when it's gone, it's gone. So you have to keep in mind that we simply have to experience our own crises now, because we simply haven't experienced any major crises in the last two or three generations, and we don't know what it's really like in such a major crisis. 70 years, never again war, was the European theme, now we make war because the experience is missing how terrible it is. Cleansing thunderstorm, Mr. Voles is right. The question is yes, I would still like to. I don't wish it. It looks like it, I don't want it either, nobody can want that, but at the moment the indicators look like we are going to run into it. There is a war on the European continent. We have the highest inflation in my lifetime, and how is that being contained? What are the politicians doing? What is the ECB doing? We have so many crises piled up. Now I am in the flow. You can't stop me. Okay, I'll stop. No. No, I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> we have more crises on the horizon than we have ever had in our lives, and politics are failing. I wouldn't want to go into politics at the moment, you can only lose there. No politician will say, I'll fix things now. 
So they are actually lost because they are trying to fight against the cosmic laws and mathematics. But this violence or this accumulation of crises will bring about this change and it will only get worse before it gets better. But the politicians will react as follows, I can already bet on that, even more redistribution, even more money. Aid packages that create even more inflation, they will set price caps, they will try to calm people down by paying another 300 euros premium. But we all have to remember that we have to pay back this debt. Everything that happens now, we will be responsible for, and that is our prosperity of the last decades. But if you say 300 euros here, here's another support. Ms. Schneider, do you already know your current new electricity bill? It is actually limited. So in my company. I think that's important because it's exploding everywhere. Just heard today that my husband was on the phone to his parents earlier, they just got their private gas bill, so their advance payments have gone up from 400 to 400 euros. In the month? In the month. A normal family home. Yes, absolutely unfunny. Um, when it comes to taxes, for example, I'm a bit undecided. Of course, the tax burden is extremely high, there's no question about that, but when it comes to sales tax, it doesn't hurt us entrepreneurs. This is a transitory item for us. That only hurts private individuals. As an entrepreneur, it doesn't really matter to me whether it's 7 or 19 percent, since Mr. Scholz announced that it should drop to 7 percent. I don't care about business. Not privately, of course, I also benefit from it privately. I have to say that we privately bought a combined heat and power unit four years ago, back then we were great because we generated electricity with it and fed it back. Now we're the bad guys because the thing eats gas like crazy. But that's a completely different story. I also have a slightly different opinion than you, we are not running into a wall, we have already run into a wall. The thing is already finished for me, the thing is really already finished. And for me everything, everything that has happened here in the last two years, is a red herring. It's been prepared for years, and for the last two years it's more like the feeling that the reins are being tightened extremely and everything is just being driven at a gallop, everything is being pushed much, much faster. And that's why it's just a diversionary maneuver for me, the card is sunk. I have a quote from Gabor Steingart, who said, word is getting around about the economic sanctions that it was a shot in the knee, it's an economic war against one's own population. Absolutely. I don't think you can deny that, you can see that. So here in Europe, yes, but American and European interests are not congruent in this conflict. And the question is who deserves it? Who benefits? Cabano, yes. USA. At least not us. The USA, also my answer. And your answer is very important. How much longer will we believe that we can do something with better politics? And when do you think the cart hit the wall? I don't have my answer yet, but you can tell when it's already too late. I mean, you realize it too late when a relationship is broken, you only really notice when it's broken, and now we've actually been talking about things being broken for a long time. At least not the way it used to be. Do we still feel the need to somehow regulate this politically? I also see that we're somewhere in between, and that's not entirely clear. We have just discussed what can actually still be controlled, or has the cart hit a wall? I think there are no more solutions in the existing system, if you know the political system, and I also know someone from the CDU and FDP, and I just have to say, unfortunately, I don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. What we talked about, we see that Lindner is suddenly in debt, that election promises are being broken, and let's be honest, we know that all politicians say all sorts of things to get elected, and then they do the opposite.
Three days after the election, I think. Exactly. And that's why I'm actually afraid that if politicians don't become really honest and tell people the truth, then there will probably be social unrest, I'm afraid. Not much is missing. But it's already being prepared, Mr. Mers said yesterday that he can become chancellor. But it's not the solution, not in the existing system, we need a completely new system. The question I ask myself is, what does a system do that has realized that it's kind of hit a wall, but nobody wants to let go because nobody knows what's coming, so the system has to stabilize itself? We are experiencing that now, but this stabilization of something that one has the feeling is no longer working, which can actually only be stabilized with violence. That's exactly the problem, the delegitimization of criticism, so to speak, I'm now the number one enemy of the state. No, I think I just want this basic law. Homeland security, okay? The new regulations. Who delegitimize criticism? Why is social protest already banned in anticipation? Social protest is actually already delegitimized before it is made. And that's where worlds really open up. What are we discussing? Until 2019 we could never have imagined that Olaf Scholz would be asked whether he would soon let the Bundeswehr shoot at citizens. So we've come so far that we're saying that. And when we say it, we think it might happen, otherwise we wouldn't say it. Just like Anger Winter, or Corona Autumn, or whatever it was with Miss Fieser. I have an entrepreneur, champion from the Swabian Alp, who said, I would like to take to the streets, I would like to demonstrate peacefully, but I don't dare. If the local newspaper takes pictures, I'm a right-wing Nazi. There was this beautiful poster that I read somewhere on Twitter, if the citizen is uncomfortable, he is immediately considered a right-wing extremist. And that is a dangerous development. We just discussed that. But that's not development. How many wake-up moments does the government or politicians in Brussels need? How can a woman from der Leyen say before the Italian elections that we have instruments, if the wrong elections are made in Italy that we will take action against them? I have friends in Italy. The fact is, Frau von der Leyen was the biggest campaigner for Malini, 100%. They all said, especially now. And now we had Sweden, flip to the right. Italy too. We see the same development in the Czech Republic and the biggest campaigners are in Brussels and, unfortunately, also in Berlin. Yes, protest from the right is not allowed, it no longer comes from the left, and then we have no protest at all, which is why we can no longer get reversal effects into society. But then the big reset cannot succeed either because reset would be, to me reset sounds like a restart of the same thing. We actually have to redefine what the right actually means. If you are like this, then you are on the right, and if you don't want to be like that then you are on the right. We have to finally get rid of these borders, no more thinking in pigeonholes, left or right, we need politics for the people. In any case. But this soccer club mentality, this local patriotism, I am this, I am that. It's over. That's from yesterday. The party landscape is outdated, everyone would say. But what specifically? New civic movement, I described in my book. Grassroots movement. Grassroots movement, so no more professional politicians, time limit, get elected once, then go back to business, minimum age 35, with professional experience, also come out of the profession, if you want to be chancellor, too, maybe, or minister of economy, minister of health, you should have an idea. If you throw on a white coat and say, attention, I'm a doctor, let me through, I want to inject. Then you can't. But here anyone can, Ursula von der Leyen can suddenly become EU president. Not even elected, but voted against elections, in Italy. I'm already talking myself into a rage, I have to calm down. They're laughing now, but I'm getting trouble from my wife, she says you're talking yourself into a frenzy and getting upset. We beep all of that. 
then I think faster and speak even faster. No, the fact is that Ms. von der Leyen, a mother of seven, can be defense minister, family minister and EU president, but she was never elected. But she can actually de facto, nothing. She divides society, she questions democracy, she wasn't elected president of the European Commission, but she tells people how democracy works. That is the EU's understanding of democracy and I find that really unbearable because I love the freedom we have, including the free market economy. And now I see only socialism, planned economy. And we all have to get out of there together, which is why I say, probably no more parties, no no more professional politicians, no more pensions, if you've been in politics for four years, you have to go back into business. And maybe also as a support, if we sometimes don't see human intelligence in politics, artificial intelligence. Excuse me very briefly Mrs. Garrett. It's all about common sense. And that's missing. Without thinking in pigeonholes, I'm a socialist, or I'm conservative, or something like that, but saying what's best for the people. Any artificial intelligence would say, shutting down nuclear power plants when we don't have any energy doesn't make any sense. I don't tear down my house either and then ask where do I actually live, under the bridge or what? But that's what we're doing right now, we're tearing down our prosperity, our house, but we don't have a solution yet, no plan B. And for me that's just ideology and dogmatism. So we probably need a whole new system, and either we do it voluntarily and create it constructively, or we are forced to do it, but with tremendous pain. I would actually agree with you that we are of course engaged in ideological politics with massive propaganda and so on. And now, of course, there is a lot of propaganda in the Ukraine as well, so to speak, as the story goes. That actually means that we make ideologized politics. Because we are no longer reasonable, that is, we set ideology against reason, that's the really big issue, and anyone who sensibly resists it because he says sensibly that we don't want to demolish demolish the house before we know what's coming next, is simply a right-wing extremist. And we should talk about what we actually call right. That is the most important thing if democracy is not to slip away from us. If right is said at every opportunity, then tomorrow everyone is right-wing extremist. If you are against or against, then you are on the right. Because of our history, the biggest stigma is being far right. So we're in a situation where many people would rather be unreasonable than be seen as right-wing. But the term is used inflationary. And that's why you have to fight back. The little anecdote I wanted to say is that this isn't the first time we've done this. If you look at the minutes of the French Revolution, how they discussed it in the town halls at the time, six minutes each, and so on. If you look at all this, you will realize that we have done this before, without the internet. Also this process of discursive democracy, we should perhaps draw lots instead of voting politicians. Those are all existing concepts. So, after the French election campaign, Melanchon also demanded that half of the deputies be elected, with lots being drawn for the others. These are all concepts that are also discussed in political science. Which would be important to understand, it will be different, but not necessarily better. At some point we will no longer find the other good either. In my opinion, it keeps getting better. Well, I think it's great, we're sitting together here in Hamburg, we're doing fair talk, with an audience, lots of people who are listening to us and are now watching the show. They applaud where they feel emotionally addressed. But I think in the end it should go beyond the applause and come into ownership and action. That's it. We are multipliers. Exactly. And everyone is a multiplier with their contribution, everyone is important. I say it at almost every show, everyone matters. I come out. Please. I am to the right. I would like to continue to peace sitting down, not standing up like a man. I'm a total family person, I think it's great when mother, father, child live together. There are other life concepts, I'm not against that, but I'm basically in favor of a conservative family concept. 
I am to the right. But conservative does not equal right. Already today. So that's the problem, thanks for the comment, but we have abolished any notion of conservative because everything is right-wing. It must be possible, I know, I come from the EU research, I question the EU very much other topic. But in principle, it must be possible to have anti-abortionists within the EU in the individual member countries, let's say Poland or Hungary, they're conservative, Christian, whatever, but of course you can't say they're right-wing because because of that, or they're just against this agenda. That means there is a conservatism. I think that's the problem of today's CDU, that the CDU what it did before, namely that it was a people's party, where at that time a Dreger and a Blum were in the same party, although they shared pretty much nothing with each other when you look at the economy. But back then it was still possible, and today we no longer have a concept of a conservative, and that's why everything that's somehow conservative is stuffy, right wing and so on. And I also find that very problematic, because there is no party, so to speak, that is socially conservative, i.e., social in the classic sense. I am against this stigmatization of socialism, we can discuss it. But social in the sense of social cohesion and yet conservative in canon as you described. Of course it makes sense to have a father and mother, and not parents one, two, three, that's actually exactly your concept of life. And what you just said is actually Maloney's speech yesterday, I'm a Christian, I'm an Italian, I'm a mother and so on. And indeed there is a certain conservatism. The values contained therein cannot be despised, but that is exactly what resists a transhumanism agenda, that everything is being deconstructed, and we have to discuss that. That doesn't mean that you exclude other models in any way, but I actually I actually believe that the search lies in a plausible conservatism that must be possible without everything being tagged as right. I grew up in West Berlin, I can't rule out any other way of life. Yes, but that we lose this border, on the left the split has also succeeded. That one splits off the left from the social liberal, so to speak. In France, for example, the big problem in France today is that the PS, the party socialist is no longer anywhere, but instead Melanchon, and he's a left-wing populist and nobody wants him. That happens everywhere, including us. And on the right it's exactly the same. Austria, the old VP was the old CDU, it was somehow the good party, whether you like it or not. Then it became the new least curs, yes, that was no longer the old VP. That means we really babble about the fact that even on the so-called right-wing or conservative side of the political spectrum, the terms between conservative and right-wing are shifting in such a way that you no longer know what is still okay. I really think that's pigeonholing. Mrs. Garrett just mentioned the word short in a different context. I'll be brief, but actually I think we just need human politics. For the people who just try to act rationally without saying we're on the left or right in the drawer. And I think all these parties have degenerated into companies, into career messengers, it's all about one's own power, one's own friends. Where is which colleague praised and so on, it has become career companies and professional companies, there is nothing else. Those who defame themselves the most and the most. Not a new idea either, 1923, politics without parties, that's important and right, but actually not new. We always get there in certain cycles where we have the feeling that we have to reinvent ourselves. That parliamentary democracy no longer works that way, that we now have the streets against established politics, incidentally in Italy and France too, everywhere. That's a fact, that's why we're reinventing democracy, with balloons, with lots and so on. And that's the process we're in. I just wanted to say, it's not reinventing the wheel, it's all been there before. We can agree here at the table that we need a non-ideological, undogmatic policy that is based on factual issues and makes decisions that are rationally comprehensible.
In this consideration, if you stand far enough to the left, of course everything is to the right. Likewise, if you're far enough to the right, everything is to the left that doesn't match your positioning. In economics there is the well-meaning dictator, welfare concepts. Then you thought again about how you can advance a society the furthest in terms of welfare. The result was that the well-meaning dictator is the one who comes closest to the good. Who would that like to be? Which may not exist. Well, that was the Republic, the Politia of Plato, the wise king, who, so to speak, withdraws himself in favor of the great Plato, Aristotle. Of course, we can no longer say that today. Because democracy, we don't want a king anymore. But in development aid, this has actually been researched. Yes, if you want to bring a country out of poverty, then you have to change a lot of processes. And before it shows results, it takes 15 years. That means what you have to prevent at all costs is that you go to the polls in the 15 years. Because at that point, somewhere, they have to push the process so far that it shows fruit, which then becomes visible. Then these successes can also be accepted and confirmed by the population. If you intervene beforehand, then something is done, and then you don't see the development aid process, the fertility. Excuse me, we started out at 2021 in Berlin, father anyway, somehow it's all a mess. What we are now discussing is a very dangerous question, what I said is actually extremely dangerous. If I now take this development aid model, Take what Mr. Voles just said, then yes, no, maybe we will discuss it. I don't want to say that apodictically at all, just what Winston Churchill said, yes, democracy is the worst form of government except all the others. So, we actually question whether the democratic process, so to speak, always leads to the best results. That's what we're discussing right now. What do we do with 2020 Berlin, with the elections that went wrong there? But then the real question is, do we want to discuss this? What happens when we discuss? We must be clear that we are discussing this today, 2022, and two years ago we would not have discussed it at all. We wouldn't have thought of that. And how risky it is. Do you understand? I think we figured that out, otherwise voter turnout wouldn't have been steadily declining for many years. I think that's the aspect. Many years ago, People came up with the idea that it doesn't matter where I put my cross, whether with the SPD or the CDU. They all do what they want anyway, you can't influence them. What you are saying, and your perception is probably correct, is, so to speak, the lack of institutional trust in the democratic process. Mr. Voles, I would now like to support you. Thank you very much. I think you wanted to say something. Well-meaning moderator, no matter how everything develops, since the Middle Ages, since the emergence of the guilds, the middle class that has developed from them, that has always been an anchor of stability. If you look through German history, since industrialization, wars, inflation, reunification, the middle class has actually always been very reliable. My hope is that no matter how this story unfolds in Germany and Europe now, small and medium-sized businesses will still have the opportunity to grow and thrive, and that whoever is in political charge takes that into account in the ideology and leaves dogmas behind and makes factual decisions. The economy with 99.6% of all businesses, 3.5 million, benefited from this because ultimately the well-being of this society depends on creating work and jobs. So that it is a human society. Then it also has to be affordable, and that is my position, coming from the middle class, that we now have taxes that are so high that it is hardly possible for us to set off again for new prosperity, also for our employees. In the meantime, we have to see where we save manpower because we can no longer afford it. So it's not just about the fact that we can no longer find skilled workers, but also about the fact that we can no longer afford them. I sat down once, I really did the math. So let's just take 365 days a year, 
then we have weekends, so how many days do the employees work, who gets paid for 365 days a year? Then I deducted the vacation, then 10 sick days per employee, which is not much. And that's how I came up with it, hold on tight, in Berlin, where we have fewer public holidays than other federal states, for 2022 I come to an employer burden of 45.2, and for 2023 we have one more public holiday, over 46% the employee is worth more to me than the gross amount I pay him. And if I now look at what other deductions he has, 23% social costs, social security contributions plus income tax, we're back to the point where I say, Social Security 40%, we're going to increase it, unemployment insurance will increase in the coming year, and the additional contribution to health insurance. He basically goes to work for 10% of his gross wages. That's why we're digitizing, because it's all too expensive. Because such a robot does not need unemployment insurance, only electricity. This is precisely the process that we do not need to discuss again. It is being substituted, so the cost drivers are, so to speak, the driver for this technological development, namely to replace more and more people with machines. The robot can hand out the bun at the counter, but if we continue with digitizing, I can hardly hand the bun over to DHL, where I don't know if it will arrive in three days. At this point I realize that we have to do a second part of this show, otherwise we'll need hours. We still have our Q&A with the audience, we take a short break, after that our audience has the opportunity to ask a few short questions. And I want to say to everyone around me, what was that about the French Revolution? Six minutes for each speaker. Give yourself a minute to make the closing words that Mr. Vols mentioned earlier come true. Do you want to start, Herr Friedrich? Gladly, so one more shocker at the end, because we also wanted to talk about energy. I think we also need to be aware that we will need fossil fuels for a long time to come. That we in Germany and Europe can never operate an energy-intensive economy with solar and wind energy only if we are willing to lose prosperity and jobs. Because at the moment there is simply a lack of technological development or storage capacity to store wind and solar energy. And politicians should also be honest here. It is also part of the truth and reality that we will continue to need coal, gas, nuclear and other fuels, probably fossil fuels, to run a viable, very energy-intensive economy. I would like to thank Mark Friedrich very much. Thanks. Mr. Vols, your plea. We have agreed that good policy is oriented to relevant issues. I therefore think it makes sense to focus on education, because education is a prerequisite for the ability to make judgments and education is at the beginning of the economic value chain. Education, training, research and development, invention, invention, innovation, products and processes, investment, growth, employment, prosperity. If an education is lacking, then the result cannot be good either. Hence my plea, put all the resources that we have that we can mobilize into the area of education, into early childhood and school education. Thank you very much Dr. Hans Jürgen Vols, thank you very much for visiting us. Mrs. Garrett. I can't think of anything else. Thanks. <laughs> that was cheeky. <laughs> I can handle it. Now a quote from Stefan Zweig, it is impossible for contemporaneity to understand the historical period in which it finds itself. So a big thank you to Professor Ulrike Garrett, thank you very much.
And the final word to Ms. Schneider. Finally, something completely different. I think the time has passed for us to make any demands or requests to our politicians, because I don't think that's any use anymore. The cart has already hit the wall for me and the politicians are still trying to get the rest out of our pockets and then say goodbye with their suitcases. I think everyone has their suitcase ready. In this respect, don't ask, hope or demand anything, not even from the associations. I don't think we're going to get anywhere with that, we have to become self-sufficient, which I think is important, and just do what we think is right. And I was already thinking in 2022 that we should never have put that stupid funny mask on our face and we should never have been told to just lock our shutters. A big thank you to Judith Flora Schneider for her visit here in Hamburg, thank you Mrs. Schneider. From this I gather that even if we no longer reinvest the energy, i.e. our energy, our life energy, to fight the old, we can at least build up the new with some of the energy. I am sure. That's why we appreciate your support. We need your support for this project in order to be able to offer such wonderful conversations with wonderful guests in the future, which should be a piece of the puzzle as a whole. So that you can form your own opinion, because it is very important to us that we not only promote discourse. That's still very important to us, but more importantly that we also have information, guests sitting here at Fair Talk, that also gives you a new perspective on things that raises awareness, and at the end promotes common sense and make a good contribution to the future. Einen neuen Blick auf die Dinge ermöglichen, die das Bewusstsein schärfen und ähm, am Ende für den gesunden Menschenverstand und für einen I thank everyone here in the studio, I thank our guests, I thank the audience, our technology, the direction. All those involved, my guests, I say good night and see you very soon at this point, thank you, bye. At eye level, 